So one of the things I've heard over the years is how irrelevant the Bible is to today, a complaint. Well, that's, that's just not even remotely true. Um, when you first read the letter to Pergamum in the seven letters, you might think that at first, but I think rather quickly today I'll help you see different. It says, And to the angel of the church at Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans, Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So it starts out, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. So what in the world is that? What does Satan's throne mean? It means that where you are is clear evidence of the reign and the influence of the Prince of Darkness. Pergamum was a city with a multitude of pagan temples, pagan worship of different fashion and flavors and forms was everywhere it took one major location there was a prominent hill if you will a small mountain i guess overlooking the city and on that mountain there were multiple temples the top of which was a temple to zeus so for all these different gods at these temples there were leaders who promoted sacrifice and food celebrations, and this worked its way all the way down to trade guilds. A part of this worship in many of these places were sexual expression as a part of the worship. Now, you have a little church there, Pergamum, the church at Pergamum. So while the church was holding fast the name of Christ and facing the consequences, simultaneously at the same time, they were tolerating among them the false teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, which were very similar in nature, the implication of the text. Now, to understand that, I need to tell you a little bit about Balaam. Balaam was an enchanter, uh, a prophet. The king of Moab comes to Balaam because Israel had approached the Moabites, and wherever they had been, they had uh, taken over. So he wanted Balaam to curse Israel so that he'd get rid of them. So he offers Balaam, this enchanter prophet, a large reward to curse the people. So Balaam agrees. So he goes and gets into his state. However, he returns and he comes back with a blessing because God gives him a blessing. So he goes back and tries again. Same thing happens. He comes back with a blessing. Uh, then that's the story in between the second and, and then the third one is when you have the story about him and the donkey, uh, where the donkey actually speaks to him. After the third time he attempts this, he finally gives up, um, but he takes a different approach because Balaam still wants the money. Now, it's not overt. This is mainly in Numbers 24 and 25. You have to go over to chapter 31 to understand what Balaam did and then go back to chapter beginning of 25 to see what happened. It says in Numbers 31, 16, Behold, these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the instant of Peor so that the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. You go back to 25 and you see what the advice they followed. So while Israel was in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal at Peor and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So here's what they did. They tied together sexual expression and worshiping Baal, false god, together they joined in with these people 
All the while, I'm sure, still claiming to be the people who were following Yahweh, the Lord. Now, let's go back to Pergamum. There is no outright denial of Christ among this church. So while they were saying Christ is Lord, they were tolerating teaching an actual practice among people in this local church of people participating in pagan worship. Now, I can hear you. Well, we don't have pagan worship today. And I say, be careful. Um, you better be careful and pay attention. We don't use the word religion a whole lot anymore. And we have what we call now the nuns. But boy, do we have religion. It's the religion of self-expression today. And everything is based on what the individual feels and whatever the individual feels, the individual expresses. And the religion is we all have to bow down to whatever that is. And this religious expression has largely taken on the form of sexual expression in our culture. And the culture is expected to celebrate. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how old you are listening to this, but depending on your age, you know what I mean. This happened fast. It happened very quickly. In 2008, uh, Barack Obama is elected president. He's against gay marriage. When he runs again in 2012, he's for it. That quickly shifted. And that almost that quickly, within four to five years, when the majority of Americans were against it, they were now for it. Bang. Happened fast. So what happened? How did we go from something that was considered wrong to be celebrated? And that those who see it as wrong are the sinners and they must be punished and silenced. Reading from a book called The Strange New World, which I highly commend, help you understand the world you live in. He says, in certain areas, such as that of homosexuality and transgenderism, to require a positive repudi repudiation of traditional sexual mores to the point where belief in or maintenance of such views has come to be seen as ridiculous and even a sign of serious mental or moral deficiency. What he's saying is, if you still think these things are wrong, in our culture now, it is so shifted that you're ridiculous and you have a sign of mental and moral deficiency. So you're crazy. Now, nobody wants to be crazy. Nobody wants to be seen as wrong. And now we have this pressure as Christians. We're supposed to be nice. So if we can't be wrong and we got to be nice, then, oh, now you've got this strange blending coming together. Now, let's think about the cultural worship that goes along with this. An entire month set aside called Pride Month. The demand during that month, really it's all year, but the demand during that month is public adherence. And shame on you if you don't. And I have a question. Why was marriage so important? Why was marriage so important in the LGBTQ plus whatever? I'm going to tell you why. This is my opinion, my thought. Because it has to appear to be sacred. There's something inside of human beings that we want to believe that what we are doing is right before God. And we're not going to say the one true God, but if it's the God of self. That, that, and, and not only is it right there, it's got to be done publicly so everybody else says that that's right. That, that's what you ought to do. And let's go back to where we started. Satan's throne, where the influence and the reign of the prince of darkness is evident. How did we get here and how did we get here so fast? Well, you no longer have to live where Satan's throne is. Because in the 2000s, we started carrying instant access to Satan's throne in our pockets. It gave us the opportunity to navigate a world instantly. Then, about 2010, we gave them to our kids. 
And we said, you go experiment and find what's out there in the rest of the world. Now, people within churches are exposed to Balaam's world instantly and in private, and their worship is a swipe away. It's affecting our children, who are now becoming adults, and is having a profound impact on the choices that they are making. It's no surprise that so many more are embracing these practices of the world because that's been in their feed for many of them their whole life. The Lord only knows the depth of sinful worship that is taking place each and every day by people who outwardly claim to hold fast to the name of Jesus. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, the answer is right here. Therefore, repent. You say, repent, that's just religious language. This is just a simple, simple call to turn from what you are doing and what you are believing and turn to the one true God and believe what he says and do what he says to do. That is worship. When we honor the Lord in our lives, in public and in private. Uh, I'm not saying we're totally the church at Pergamum, um, but we certainly are standing at Pergamum's front door because so much of this is happening everywhere and the influence and impact is all over us. So we need to read this letter and we need to heed what it says. 